So today we're going to talk about ocular motor palsies, by which I mean palsies affecting the third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves. Okay, and we'll revise that anatomy in a bit. But in a nutshell, these are palsies that affect the movements of the eye. The movements are, and it's usually one eye. So the one eye is not moving correctly anymore. And as a result, you get double vision because both eyes are focused on the same target. So the most common presenting complaint here is diplopia. Okay, that's what we'll be talking about today. This is where it fits in to your curriculum. So it's alongside conditions that cause ptosis, drooping of the eyelid, and alongside <coughs> conditions that cause anisocoria, which is unequal pupils. And broadly, these fall under the subspecialty of neuro-ophthalmology, okay? So that's the intersection of neurology and ophthalmology. Neuro-ophthalmology is hard. So I'm a retinal specialist. This is not my area of subspecialty. And I have to think about neuro presentations twice when I see them in the real world. So what I've tried to do for you guys here is really distill it down to the core knowledge that you're gonna need as say interns emergency where you may well see someone presenting with diplopia and ocular motor palsy, okay? Um, here's an example. So here we've got a young child who's being instructed to look to the left, right? And you can see their right eye is turned in. We call that a adduction, a deduction. But the left eye isn't turned out. The, the eyes don't look aligned. You don't need to be an ophthalmologist to have a look at that and see that the eyes don't look aligned. So we've got an abduction deficit in the left eye caused by an obtusin's nerve palsy or a six nerve palsy. Okay. So here's a case of six nerve palsy in the left eye of a child. That's a case presentation or, or summary, and that's a typical neuroophthalmic presentation. We'll talk about six nerve palsy soon. So in neuro-ophthalmology, you get diseases of the nervous system that certainly can affect vision. That's cranial nerve two. We won't be talking about that today because that's covered in another one of the lectures, which is already online. Acute visual disturbance part two, I think, covered uh, optic neuropathy. So that's cranial nerve two. Today, we'll be talking about three, four, and six. And three, four, and six control eye movements. Cranial nerve three controls is involved in pupil reflexes and it's also involved in eyelid position. So that, they're the presenting complaints, but most importantly, diplopia. Uh, so, you know, the cranial nerves that are involved in supplying the eye, it's two through to seven. You know, five supplies sensation and seven supplies facial muscles, including eyelid actually. Uh, but today, as I say, we'll be focusing on three, four, and six, but, but they're the ones that are important to eyes. And these are not rare. They're not common, but they're not rare. So as a GP or an e in ED, you, you, know, you may well see them and that's why they're included in the curriculum. <coughs> what are our learning objectives today? An understanding of the relevant anatomy and don't worry, we're not gonna go into crazy detail and I'm gonna make it easy for you by letting you know what's important. Relevant history and exam is important because that can very quickly guide you to which extraocular muscle we think is involved and what the etiology might be. So you, we want you to work towards an idea of which muscles involved, what's the cranial nerve and what's, what are the possible etiologies. So that can guide your management, particularly investigations and possibly treatment and referral. Now, as an intern in ED, you're not gonna be the person making all of these decisions. You're obviously gonna do it under supervision but you want to have some idea. You don't want to be total blank when the person with diplopia walks in. So they're the three conditions we'll be covering today. Sometimes they present with frank diplopia. Doctor, I'm seeing two, I'm seeing double. But often it's not so clear cut. In the real world, the visual complaints can be more vague. For your purposes in an OSCE or a written exam situation, we'll make it frank diplopia. But I just want you to know that in the real world, it's not always so clear cut. And also in the real world, it's not always a mononeuropathy, not always a sixth. It might be a sixth, a seventh, and an eighth. 
And when it's a polyneuropathy, that increases the likelihood that you may have a space occupying lesion in the head. The most common cause of extraocular muscle palsy, whether it's three, four, or six, is microvascular infarction based on microvascular disease in a person with vascular risk factors, most importantly, diabetes and hypertension. Uh, that's the most common, but the most dangerous is an intraocular tumor. So your job is to rule out the life threatening thing. And then microvascular becomes the diagnosis of, of exclusion, really. So we'll, go, we'll have a bit of an overview today, which we've done. Then I'll go through some relevant anatomy, history and relevant history and exam, the palsies themselves, and then a summary at the end. So let's talk about the anatomy. So the muscles that supply extraocular movements, there are six, okay? And this can be boiled down to be made quite simply. You've got four rectus muscles, and they all have one main action. Lateral rectus moves the eye <coughs> laterally, okay? Medial rectus moves the eye medially. Superior moves it up, and inferior moves it down. That should all be quite intuitive. The slightly fiddlier ones are the inferior oblique and the superior oblique because they have a slightly funny course, especially the superior oblique. The more important of those two is superior oblique. That's supplied by the trochlear nerve, fourth cranial nerve, and we'll talk about its main actions in a moment. But if you just remember four rectus muscles plus two oblique muscles, the levator muscle of the upper eyelid is also relevant because it's supplied by the third cranial nerve. And in the third cranial nerve palsy, you can get a ptosis and get the eyelid dropping down. Okay, so levator means elevate, pull the eyelid up, open the eye. That's what that muscle does. Hence, in a third nerve palsy, you get a, an acute ptosis. So that's also relevant. You can add that to the mix. Here's another way of looking at this. And this demonstrates their actions. The obliques actually have three actions. They've got a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary action. For your purposes, um, the main ones to know is the primary actions, which is what we call torsion, which really means twisting the eye. So the superior oblique twists the eye inwards towards the nose, the inferior oblique does the opposite. And as I say, superior oblique's more important because an isolated fourth nerve palsy presents in a certain way. <coughs> and I'll talk more about that later. So the rectus muscles move it in one direction. The obliques do torsion, twisting in or out. What about the cranial nerves? Well, there's six, four, and three. But how can we distill this? This is a pretty complex diagram. Let's say that all three of these cranial nerves originate from the brainstem. Okay? They originate from the brainstem. Two of them come out the front, they exit anteriorly. That's three and six. Three is higher, more superior. Six is lower, more inferior. Okay? They come out the front and then they course anteriorly. And they go through a structure called the cavernous sinus, which is next to the blood supply to the brain, okay, the internal coronal artery. And then they enter the orbit and then they supply the relevant muscles. The fourth cranial nerve exits from the back and it decussates. So it goes the opposite way and supplies the contralateral eye, okay. Third and sixth supply the ipsilateral eye. Eye on the same side. Fourth supplies the eye on the other side. So if I've got a right fourth nerve palsy, you're thinking about my left. And then it exits on the left. Okay. And that can, so when you're making your MRI request, because you're worried about like, dorsal midbrain, you can say query left sided dorsal midbrain lesion, let's say. Because the fourth is on the other side, the other two are on the same side. Other relevant bits of anatomy: the sixth uh, cranial nerve makes this funny kink before it comes up along the brainstem and enters the orbit. And we think that that little kink, unusual course that the sixth nerve takes, 
is what predisposes it to being a bit more vulnerable to raised intracranial pressure. Okay? So when the pressure in the head goes up, it's often the sixth cranial nerve that gets affected rather than the third or the fourth. But when you see a sixth cranial nerve palsy, like that picture of the child that I showed you earlier, raised intracranial pressure is on your list of possible causes. And the relevant anatomy is possibly that little kink in the stress cranial nerve that the other two don't have. Relevant anatomy about the fourth, well, I talked about the fact that it decussates, but also it's very long and very thin. It's got the longest intracranial course. And that might be why it's the cranial nerve that seems to be most susceptible to head trauma. So a car accident or a fall, they're the typical scenarios. If it's going to result in you know, extra ocular nerve palsy, is more often fourth rather than third or sixth. Right. What's relevant about the third? Well, it's very close to posterior communicating artery at one point along its course. So, piton, you know, you've got the anterior communicating artery and the posterior communicating artery, the circle of Willis. At one point, it runs quite close to the posterior communicating artery. So, when you get a third nerve palsy, one of your possible causes is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. So aneurysm is a more common cause in third nerve palsies than it is in a sixth or a fourth. So in this way, the anatomy of the cranial nerves guides you as to what the etiology might be. Fourth, you think trauma. Third, you think aneurysm. Sixth, you think raised into cranial pressure. Okay. Right, history. Um, you know, an ophthalmology vision can always be affected, <coughs> but in cranial nerve palsies, the visual symptoms can be quite variable. As in, if I, let's say they've got diplopia and I occlude one eye, I eliminate their diplopia. As long as their optic nerve is okay, they may have, they may, they may well have perfect vision. In them. There's nothing wrong with clarity and color per se, right? There can be. We'll talk about that later. So this is not always the most important symptom. The most important symptom in these cases is diplopia, okay? Double vision. You can also get unequal pupils. I talked about that at the start. An acute ptosis in the third nerve palsy. Ophthalmoplegia, meaning uh, that's a sign, it's not a symptom. Although it can be a symptom if their friends have said, oh, your eyes don't look straight. They look in the mirror and they think, you know, their eyes are wonky. You can get nystagmus acutely when you've got a, an extraocular muscle palsy because the control is disturbed, so you don't get nice smooth movement. It can be painful, most importantly with a third nerve palsy. And what you worry about there is dissection of the internal carotid artery uh, or, or an aneurysm that's bleeding. Okay? Dissection of the internal body more commonly causes Horner syndrome, which we won't talk about today. We'll talk about that next week. Okay. Then they can get systemic symptoms. If they've got a brain tumor, if they've got raised intracranial pressure, they can certainly get systemic symptoms. So as part of your history, you don't just ask about the and your vision. You also ask about, do you have a headache? Do you have any pain anywhere else? Can you hear your heartbeat in your ears? Can you hear a whooshing sound in your ears? That's what tends to sound like. Okay. And then... You know, polyneuropathies. Do you have any numbness, pain, tingling, that sort of thing? Is anything else affected or you're otherwise well? That's all part of your history. Onset can guide you. So this is kind of surgical sieve stuff. You can apply this to almost any neurology. And extra optimal muscles are, are no exception. So if it's fairly sudden, if it's acute, well, either the blood supply has just been cut off or compromised. Or they've been whacked in the head, it's trauma. And trauma should come out quite obviously in the history. You need to ask about that. Um, infection can do it. So let's say encephalitis, meningitis. Again, there should be other signs and symptoms. And then giant cell arthritis, which particularly can cause a six nerve palsy in older people. That needs to be on the list of causes, right? And that can be quite quick. The giant cell arthritis is covered in another. 
Lecture can also cause an optic neuropathy, can blind people, it's an important condition to be aware of. Demyelination, which might be multiple sclerosis, that tends to be subacute, happening over weeks, may well have systemic symptoms as well. And then if it's more gradual, it's more likely to be a slowly growing tumor, possibly. So again, this hopefully is all somewhat intuitive. So when you ask how long you have the symptoms for, you start to get an idea of what the etiology might be. As I said at the start, the majority of these are microvascular. So a middle-aged person with vascular risk factors, but we need to rule out the dangerous stuff. So when you're taking a history in the OSCE setting or in real life, I characterize a diplopia, okay? So we said the lateral rectus moves the eye outwards. So if my lateral rectus is gone, the eye can't turn it out, I'm going to get horizontal diplopia. Two images side by side. Right? The fourth nerve is involved in torsion. So they might get a sort of diagonal diplopia. But very often in the fourth, you also get a vertical diplopia. Right? Particularly on down gaze, because <coughs> aside from torsion, one of the other actions of the fourth nerve is depression of the eye, right? Making the eye look down. And so if you can't look down, then you're going to get vertical diplopia. Right? One eye stuck here, seeing out there, one eye is looking down, so you're going to get one image on top of the other. Third nerve falls, this can be variable. You can get vertical, you can get diagonal, they're probably the two more common things. You don't tend to get a frank horizontal diplopia, that's more six nerve falls. Okay, so try and characterize the diplopia. Is your representative complaint how long? Okay, talked about that. Uh, were you hit in the head or in a car accident, any injury or accident, and then systemic symptoms, headache, pain anywhere else, tinnitus we talked about, in a 70 plus year old person, scalp tenderness, jaw cortication, are you systemically unwell, thinking of giant cell arthritis, do you have any peripheral neuropathy, numbness, tingling, thinking, demyelination, MS. Okay, don't forget the systemic history. And then past medical history, vascular risk factors. Thyroid eye disease can cause all of these things. It's a real masquerade. Thyroid eye disease can cause diplopia, can stuff up your extraocular muscles. Usually by that point, it's quite obvious because they've got proptosis, red eyes. They look like a thyroid eye patient. Let's just ask if they're hyperthyroid. And then myasthenia is another masquerade. But ask if they've got a known history of myasthenia or others. Those patients tend to get tired towards the end of the day, that fatigability. If they've got an established diagnosis, that needs to be good. So that's the history. Examination wise, look, this is the this is always your examination for eye patients. You don't skip any of these steps. So every time you see an eye patient, you're thinking five elements of the ophthalmic examination. And the abbreviation is ACROC. Okay. That's in the videos that are online. You're going to go through that today in the clinical skills workshop. So that goes without saying, that's not in question. But what's special about extraocular nerve pause is that you also want to test eye movements. Now, this we haven't made a video about this yet, and I'm going to go through it today. There's nine positions of gaze that you want to get people into and test. There's different ways of doing this. I'm going to show you my way, but in the eye clinic or elsewhere, you may well see other ways. Neurologists have their own ways of doing it. You start off by giving the person a distance target, so they're just looking straight ahead. So we call that primary gaze. So give them a target in the distance to look at. Look at the doorknob, let's say. It's four meters away. Keep looking there. Don't look at Do the eyelids look fairly symmetric? Is there an obvious ptosis? Are the eyes looking straight ahead? It's one eye turned in. That's what you're looking for in primary gaze. I then do an H shape. So I go left and up, and then down, and then come back, and then go up and down. And then I'll just go across the top superiorly, seeing what they do in up gaze, and then across the bottom inferiorly. And it does help if you can, sometimes you'll need to lift up the eyelids. You can use one hand to do that. Just gently lift up the eyelids and give them a target so you can inferiorly. There you nine positions of gaze. I'll be showing you more photos of these for the different extra optic muscles. And then you, know, you also want to, if they've got an extra optic muscle pause, you need to do a full cranial movement. 
You need to have it isolated or if it's a polyneuropathy. Then you may also need to do a full neurological exam, right? Depending on the presentation. Don't forget those. Any questions so far before we get into the actual conditions? No. There we go. Running behind. Okay. So look, if you take nothing else away from this lecture, take this excellent cartoon. This is an ophthalmologist in North America somewhere who makes these nice videos. He was actually, I think he was an animator that became an ophthalmologist. So he's got these, he does all kinds of excellent animations online. Third nerve palsy, I talked about aneurysm. Remember, it's close to the posterior communicating artery. You have ptosis because it supplies that levator muscle. And because you've got unopposed action of the lateral rectus now, lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth, not by the third. So medial rectus action is gone. The eye is just unopposed being pulled by the lateral rectus. It goes out for that reason. Superior rectus is also gone. That's supplied by the third. But the fourth nerve is still active. And as I said, one of the actions of the fourth nerve is also to depress the eye. It twists the eye in, but it also depresses it, right? So fourth is working, it's down, and six is working, it's out. So down and out with ptosis is a third nerve palsy. Most common cause of all is vasculopathic. You need to think about tumor with all of them, but the special one with thirds is an aneurysm. With fourths, because your depression, which is one of the actions of the fourth, isn't working, the eye will be turned up. And for reasons that we don't need to go into, that's most accentuated when the person's looking inwards, right? So if my left fourth nerve is affected, it's gonna be most noticeable when I'm looking inwards. So away from the side that's affected. So we call that contralateral gaze. And what you get there is what we call a nasal upshoot. Nasal upshoot. So as the eye moves towards the nose, it shoots upwards. You shouldn't do that. Eye moves towards the nose, it should stay exactly in line with the other eye and on the horizontal midline. But in a fourth nerve palsy, because you've lost that depression, it's actually depression in adduction. That's what the fourth nerve does, mostly in adduction. You've lost that, so it pops up. Nasal upshoot. So if you remember nothing else about fourth nerve, remember nasal upshoot, okay? And I said up top that yeah, trauma uh, most commonly affects the fourth because it's long, narrow course. Also quite a common congenital problem, maybe because it has that funny course and then it twists around the bony trachea before inserting into the eyeball. But kids can get born with fourth nerve palsies. Finally, the sixth nerve, the eye is going to be turned in because you've got unopposed medial rectus action, right? Lateral rectus isn't there pulling it out. Middle rectus is over, overworking, let's say, and pulls the eye into its mouth. So the sixth, I think, is the simplest, and the fourth is probably the trickiest. Sixth, think intracranial pressure as well as the other courses. That is actually the summary of today's lecture, okay? But we're going to go into it in a bit more detail. Right? Okay, so here's my nine positions of gaze. Now, if you get presented with a picture like this, you can look at it any old hour. This is how I look at it. I look at primary gaze first. Is there an obvious ptosis? Maybe. This side is slightly lower than this one, but that might just be age-related. I'm going to shelf that for now. I then look horizontally, because if they've got a six, you immediately pick that up. And if you look at this guy, in his left gaze, his left eye not turning out. So immediately I know he's got a six, a left six, if nothing else. I've got my first diagnosis. I then look at the superior and inferior ones because if he's got a third, he won't be able to look up. And he's looking up fairly symmetrically. So superior rectus is fine. Looking down, to inferior rectus is fine. So it seems like his third is probably okay. And then I look along the whole top and whole bottom rows. And I mentioned that they get a nasal upshoot in a fourth. That eye hasn't shot up. Neither is that one. That's, that's all looking okay. 
Uh, that looks fairly symmetric, that looks fairly symmetric. No major offshoot, no major offshoot. So this man has a left six nerve palsy. All right. Now he looks middle aged based on his wrinkles. So that should then guide you as to what the likely etiology is, which is going to be my left microvascular six. But let's talk about some of the other possibilities. So, yeah, trawler can cause six as well. Uh, the raised ICP we talked about. So, raised ICP, you're going to have other symptoms, right? Most common cause of raised ICP is idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is covered in, in, I think it's covered in the optic neuropathy lecture. So, just have a, a review of that. Those people may have pulsatile tinnitus and headache and, and other symptoms. Usually, it's young women. Uh, think gyrosolitaritis as a set up top with a six nerve palsy. And I should say, six nerve palsy is the most common extra Of the third, fourth, and sixth, this is the most common one. So, what do they present with? Horizontal dyslopia. <laughs> it's worse when they're looking at distance because when you look close, you get that convergence reflex, right? So the eyes turn in, it's less obvious. But when you look in the distance, more likely for the affected eye to stay turned. Unopposed action of the movie rings. And it's worse on looking to the same side as the eye. So again, if my right lateral rectus isn't working, I can't turn it out. If I'm looking towards that eye, it's going to be more obvious that I've got an abduction in the facility. And for that reason, they get an esotropia. Esotropia means the eye is turned. That's our jargon for intern, right? So the examination finding is an esotropia. That man had a slight esotropia in his left eye. And again, it's worse at distance and worse on ipsilateral gaze, looking toward the affected eye. The horizontal diplopia with esotropia, that's what a six does. You don't have to use that language, okay? You can just say his eye's not turning out. It's not turning outwards, it's not turning laterally, it's not turning temporally, whatever you want to say. You just more important for me is that you understand it. What are some of the differentials? Thyroid I mentioned. Normal tumor can do this. So you want to check for proptosis. Okay. There's another condition called Duane syndrome, which you don't need to know about, but if you want to get a gold star on the exam, you can memorize that. That's an inherited condition you tend to see in kids when they get an abduction deficit. Uh, what's the management here? Well, you want to do neuroimaging. This is contentious, right? So if it's an obvious or very likely to be a microvascular. Some people will say you don't need to use it. Just give them time because microvascular six get better on their own. And what you need to do is manage the vascular response, right? If they're older, then you want to think about full black activity SR CRP. If you don't know about the vascular factors, you want to think about blood sugar, lipids, blood pressure, other bloods if you think they're indicated. But in, in a six and a younger person, you know, that's unusual. So they're under 50, if they've got systemic symptoms or another neuropathy, history of cancer, so you're thinking about MET, uh, or they're really healthy, then yeah, you, know, you want to think about an MRI of the brain and all this. Uh, looking for a dorsal midbrain lesion or a basal skull lesion, something like that. Okay. And remember, it's ipsilateral, right? So that's your workup. And you're going to involve ophthalmology, and you may want to involve neurology as well, particularly if they've got other symptoms, right? What about what's your advice? Well, anybody who's got diplopia, acute diplopia, should not drive, right? That's part of the driving standards for Australia. We'll talk about it a bit later. For day to day life getting by, they can occlude uh, the affected eye, and that will eliminate their diplopia. And in most cases, it will slowly get better on its own. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. If you exclude the eye, yes. are you then allowed to drive? No. Okay. No, because then, because then you've got, uh, that's the same as having unilateral visual loss, which has its own effects on the driving standard. And the advice there is that if you suddenly become monocular instead of binocular, you should really hold off on driving for about three months, which is about how long it takes to develop depth perception with one eye only. So we all rely, assuming we all have two eyes in this room, we all rely on binocularity for depth perception. 
If you lose one eye, you can develop monocular cues to depth perception, such as that chair looks bigger than that chair, or this chair is uh, obstructing my view of the person behind me. So neurologically, you develop these monocular cues for depth perception. But that takes time to develop, and we think about 90 days. The driving standard says losing one eye 90 days before you really should drive. In reality, patients who have lost vision in one eye will often be on the road in a month. You know, that's just what happens in the real world. But you need to try and keep people as, as safe as possible, right? You don't want to patch kids necessarily because if you patch a kid's eye for a long time, if they're under 13, uh, the visual potential of that eye starts to drop off, right? That the eye is now experiencing what we call visual neglect, and its long term visual uh, potential at that age is plastic, as in it can be improved or made worse by patching, right? And if you patch an eye for long enough, it'll eventually develop a really poor vision. Right? It's still developing its visual potential. So don't patch kids for any long period of time if you're thinking about patching a kid if they need to be seen by the But certainly in an adult, it's a reasonable thing to do to get rid of short-term diplopia. If they have persistent and stable diplopia after some months, then we can use what are called special prism lenses to help correct the diplopia. You can inject Botox into the medial rectus, which decreases its action, gives the lateral rectus a bit more of a chance, if you like, to pull the eye into a straight position. And then they can have extra ocular muscle surgery, what we call strabismus surgery, to correct the position of the eye. So at least in primary days, they don't have double vision. So there's some of the longer term things if the eye doesn't recover on its own. But in most cases, three months, four months, uh, systemic qualities resolve on their own. So this, the management here is really about systemic management of risk factors for most people, okay? But don't forget, raised ICP, make sure you ask about and you know, all those other things that I mentioned, and GCA in an older person. All right, so on to our next case. Now, this is subtle, but this guy to me has a little bit of a head tilt. His head is tilted slightly to his left, which uh, is a clue. And if I do my little horizontal check here, abduction is normal there. Abduction is normal there, but I think you'll agree with me that there's a nasal upshoot on this side. Okay. And that's typical for a fourth nerve palsy. Let's have a look at some of the other images. So if you have a look at the depression, how far down that eye is turned in abduction, compared to how far down his right eye is turned in abduction, you agree it's less. This eye is relatively higher, his right eye compared to his left eye in adduction. And you, you also see there's some asymmetry even in up gaze. That's rest relevant. The money really here for this guy are these two images. Right? Now to confirm the fourth nerve palsy, ophthalmologists will do something called a three-step test where they tilt the head one way uh, and then the other. And the fourth nerve palsy is made more obvious on ipsilateral head tilt, right? So we turn, we're tilting his head towards the affected eye. And if you see what I'm seeing, his right eye looks relatively more superior on right head tilt than it does on left head tilt. Okay. Now you don't need to know this stuff, but I'm gonna explain it to you just for interest. Okay? We don't expect you guys to do what we call this three-step test. That's really an ophthalmic thing, but I want to explain it to you because I think the understanding is helpful, right? I said earlier that the fourth nerve turn twists the eye in, right? So if the action in his right eye is for it to twist in, if he loses that, the right eye is relatively going to be twisted out, right? The unopposed opposite action is going to twist it out because you don't have a nice twisting in effect. So the right eye twists outward. So what does he do to compensate? He turns his whole head slightly to the left. So that makes the eye straight. The left eye can cope with that because it's superior and inferior obliques are fine. 
So it will twist itself into an appropriate position. So he's got a compensatory left head tilt to make up for his lack of intorsion of the right eye, right? So if we put him into a full-on left head tilt, he's very happy. The eyes are relatively balanced there. If we exaggerate his existing problem and put him into a right head tilt, then it gets worse. And what he's got there is called a hypertropia. Hypertropia means the eye's up. Hypotropia means it's down. You can also say it's elevated as opposed to depressed. It doesn't matter. The eye's up. It's worse on tilting to the affected side. So as I say, don't expect you to know this last bit, but hopefully it helps with understanding what the hell the fourth nerve does and, and why it's worse and why people might walk in with their head tilted. Right? And they're tilting away from the affected side. So we do want you to know that head tilt is part of the presentation on fourth nerve palsy. That's important, right? He's going to have vertical diplopia. Even in primary gaze, his right eye is slightly higher than his left, but that vertical diplopia is most accentuated in down gaze, right? See, it's really obvious there, that versus that. So these people come in saying, I've got double vision when I'm walking down steps, I've got double vision when I'm trying to read, right? Oh, are the steps on top of one another or they're side by side or they're more on top? Or well, they're on top of their slightly diagonal. That's okay, that's a fourth thing you have to do. Uh, the words on the page, are they on top of each other or they're side by side? Oh, it's more. That's a typical fourth minute. Did you have an accident recently? Yes. I was in a car accident. So again, that's a typical fourth nerve scenario. So remember the fourth nerve is the only one that thinks it's posteriorly, it's got a long course, and that long, thin nerve is what we think predisposes a damage from trauma. And it's also more common congenitally, so children with a, with a four. But again, the most common cause is microvascular. So vertical diplopia I talked about, the compensatory head tilt away from the affected size, diplopia worse on down gaze, and the nasal oxygen we talked about as well. Okay. Uh, differentials look similar to the others, to be honest. Fourth is difficult to diagnose sometimes. And it can be difficult to differentiate from a third. So if you're not sure whether it's a, a fourth, the other likely thing is a third, right? with six being different altogether. Management-wise, uh, neuroimaging, again, that's a common theme with all of these guys. And we're worried about a dorsal midbrain contusion, if it's been an injury or possibly a hemorrhage or an infarct. No, I think it's more of a stroke type patient. Again, vascular risk factors and very similar advice as far as driving and then longer term patching and prison and, and surgery. And again, the microvascular ones tend to do quite well, which most of these are. So you'll, you'll see that the management and prognosis for third, fourth, and sixth is really very similar in a sense. You want to exclude life threatening thing. You want to think about the causes that are more common with that particular palsy, and hopefully you arrive at what looks like a microvascular cause. Okay, well, we've done fourth and sixth, so this is obviously a third. And on primary gaze, look, we've got a, obviously got a ptosis. And under that ptosis, if you agree with me, the eye looks down and out. <coughs> so this is a quite a typical third. So if we scan horizontally, in right gaze, medial rectus is doing nothing. So the eye is not turning. Right? Fourth nerve palsy doesn't do that. Sixth nerve palsy doesn't do that. So it's a third. His abduction is okay on left gaze. Okay, that makes sense. I'm happy with that. Lateral rectus is still working. So lateral rectus not involved. Um, if we go up and down, superior rectus not working. Inferior rectus actually still doing a reasonable job, but pulled outwards because of lateral rectus. So, you know, the third nerve has branches that supply the various rectus muscles. One branch can be more affected than others. In this person, inferior rectus doesn't appear to be as badly affected. That's okay. Um, lateral gaze and down gaze is okay because the six is working, but you can see medial gaze and down gaze. <coughs> he's, getting, he's getting no action at the middle. So. 
And then again, superior rectus affected in, in all positions of gait. So kind of a barn door, third nerve palsy. The other important thing to look for with third nerve palsy is, is, is the pupil affected. That's critical. And I'll explain why in a moment. It's not so obvious here with this person because he's got dark irises, but what you're looking for is to see if the pupil's blown, okay? So if they've got a blown pupil or a midriatic pupil, okay? Midriasis means dilated, myrosis means constricted. Again, that's our jargon. You can say dilated, constricted, large pupil, small pupil. What you're looking for is asymmetry, right? And a blown pupil in a third nerve palsy is very suspicious for an aneurysm because the, uh, the fibers that supply constriction are parasympathetic, right? Uh, imagine if you're frightened, your pupils dilate. So that's a sympathetic response. If you're relaxed, your pupils constrict, right? So that's parasympathetic. So you've got parasympathetic fibers supplying constriction. They travel in the ocular motor nerve. They travel in the third nerve, right? And they're on the outside of the nerve. Rather than towards the central nerve, they're more on the outer. So when the third nerve travels near the posterior communicating artery, if there's an aneurysm there, the first fibers that are going to be affected are going to be the parasympathetic fibers because they're the most outermost fibers, right? And you knock out the parasympathetic supply, you knock out pupil constriction. That's the reason why a blown pupil in a third is worrying. If you think, oh, pupil's not constricting, constriction is a parasympathetic response, parasympathetic part of the colon, I know they're on the outside of the nerve. Okay. If the pupil's not blown, it's more likely to be microvascular cause. No big fat aneurysm. Okay. So distinguishing between people involving and non-people involving is important. Some of us won't do neuroimaging if the pupil's not involved. If the pupil's not involved, I'll just watch them. Okay, it's probably microvascular. But I probably want to see them every day because it can go from non-pupil involving to pupil involving if the aneurysm continues to expand or if they have Me personally, I've done both in the past. These days I probably just image, to be honest, because I don't want to go home and worry about them. Um, but, you know, traditionally how we taught is your own image, you know, if, if, if you really think it's indicated. Okay. Obviously, with this, you know, in the real world, you'll be discussing this with the senior. So it's just a cartoon. This is by the same animator, ophthalmologist that I talked about. There's a superficial parasympathetic fiber. This is a sagittal section. Here's a cranial nerve coming anteriorly, and there's a posterior communicating artery up there, and there is a causing pupil involvement. Causes again, yes, microvascular once again, but the special one with birds is, is aneurysm. And if the pupil's not involved, then think uh, ischemic. Obviously there's diplopia, it can be quite variable diplopia, not simply horizontal or, or vertical. Uh, you can get pain sometimes with thirds because um, it supplies so many muscles. And uh, pupils we've talked about, and then ptosis, don't forget about that. And then the down and out, you can say that, that's a common expression. Um, look very similar differentials to the others. Don't forget giant cell arthritis in an older patient. And as I say, the acute third of the dilated pupil, that's immediate neurology. That's CT, CT angiography or MR angiography, whatever you can get first. Um, lots for GCA, if you think that's relevant. Medical management again, and then uh, same management as the other. All these. And again, most of these do um, quite well if they're microvascular. All right, so they're the three main conditions that I want to go through today. I'm just going to touch on fitness to drive. These are the new natural standards that were actually published this year. The last set of standards were in 2016. The advice, as far as eyes go, is, is more or less the same. So let's just go through those briefly. If you have acute diplopia, then generally you're not fit to drive. 
And the test there is, is there the fallopian within the central 20 degrees of fixation? So here's central fixation, here's 90 degrees, and central 20 degrees is 10 degrees this way and 10 degrees this way. So we're really talking about, about a very limited uh, you know, area that you're allowed to have, uh, you know, that, you're, that you need in order to drive. And so if they've got it within 20 degrees from central fixation, then the advice is no. If it's within here, then you can't drive, right? If you've got 20 degrees where you don't have diplopia, then with head turning, you should be able to see most of the world, as long as you've got both eyes. Both eyes working. Um, for diplopia management with an occluder, three months non driving period. So that's similar to occlusion. Uh, that's, and, and that's similar to a ptosis, actually. A ptosis is kind of like you've, you've got a biological occluder. Yeah. So that three month period applies again. So they're on the side of caution, no driving until you've seen an ophthalmologist. What about uh, sudden loss of unilateral vision? This goes for an optic neuropathy or retinal detachment, any cause of sudden visual loss, but also acute ptosis from a third or from a Horner syndrome. And as we spoke about earlier, we're talking about a three month period where they really shouldn't be tried. Okay. I'll do another lecture possibly later this year on um, driving. So if that gets posted online before your end of year exam, then we'll consider that. Example. There is a PowerPoint on LMS already that talks about driving standards, but we won't focus on it as an examinable subject unless I do a, a lecture on it. So look out for that in the uh, in the lead up to your um, final exams. Driving standards aren't complicated. It's really a handful of points that you need to know, but they are important. So to summarize, guys, that's your summary cartoon. Okay, if you can commit that to memory. The positions of gaze, the deficits in movement, the typical diplopia that results, and then the common causes. If you want to nerd out on the primary, secondary, and tertiary actions of extraocular muscles, the more you learn about this stuff, the more interesting it is. You guys have a busy curriculum, which is why this is not examinable. But the more you learn about it, the easier it will make your understanding of the patient that presents with acute diplopia particularly superior oblique, because it does different things. The more, most important ones being twisting in and depression, okay? And there's heaps of diagrams online that sort of simplify that. You can commit those to memory. So look, that's our lecture for today. Hopefully we've covered most of that. Um, next week, I will probably go through pupils next week. So anisocoria, asymmetric pupils, and the approach to anisocoria. That's quite a fiddly topic, so I think it deserves its own um, lecture. It's a lot of neurology, really. So hopefully it's doubled up with any neurology terms that we do, and maybe with emergency and, and GP terms that you do. Um, that'll be next Friday, but yeah, thanks for listening and 